How can a good and loving God have wrath and anger? If you struggle with understanding God's wrath and punishment of sin, you'll need to see this truth in Romans chapter one. This changed my view of sin and God's wrath, and it clearly articulates why God's wrath is just. There's a revelation here in Romans chapter one that people reject, and by doing so, they earn God's wrath for themselves. So let's see what this is and jump into the word of God. So here we are in Romans chapter one, verse 16. And when we read the Bible, we wanna think about everything that has been said before this verse. And we can go through that. Paul has introduced himself. Himself. Paul has talked about the gospel uh, that brings salvation, that is producing fruit in the nations that the church in Rome uh, has believed in. He's talked about the gospel, the central focus of this letter. Now we get to verse 16, and Paul's going to continue to talk about the gospel that he longs to preach in Rome. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. So I'm just going to highlight the gospel because it's repeated so much, not just in this letter, um, but also specifically here in this section of Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For, or here's why, because it is the power of God for salvation. So the gospel is indeed the power of God unto salvation, meaning salvation is what is produced through believing this message of Jesus. That's why it's the power of God. Think of how in the Old Testament, the power of God would be on full display through signs and wonders and miracles and salvation and, and works of awesome you know, power. And here we have the work of salvation being accomplished or demonstrated and articulated through this gospel. So there's no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. And he says this gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, I have a question initially. Why is it that the Jew is the one who is listed as being first, and then it says, and also to the Greek, or those who are outside of the nation of Israel? Why does Paul seem to make this uh, hierarchy, at least from what it seems to be uh, portrayed as, is some kind of hierarchy? He says the Jew is first, and also to the Greek. Is it a hierarchy, or is it an order of events? He says the salvation that comes through the gospel, right, uh, is available to the Jew first and also to the Greek, meaning Jesus came, salvation came to the Jewish nation first. Israelites are the first to encounter and have this salvation available to them. The Greeks or those outside of Israel came after Israel as a nation uh, seemed to reject the salvation God brought through his son. And so the salvation that comes through the gospel, we want to think about how uh, Paul is going to uh, unpack even more this tension between Gentile and Jew. And he's already touched on it um, a little bit. Okay, so what we want to think about is as it relates to what we're about to see, the wrath of God, and as it relates to what's already been talked about, the gospel and Paul's mission as an apostle, what does this have to do with what's come before it? And what does it have to do with what comes after it? Okay, so I just want to keep the main ideas in mind as I read this, which is the gospel, Paul's calling, and as an apostle, Paul's desire to go to Rome and preach the gospel. And this is, in in a sense, part of the reason why he's so excited to preach the gospel in Rome, because it's the God has jam-packed salvation into this message, so that when one believes, salvation is released into their life. It's the power of God to accomplish salvation in a purple person's life through the message of the son, through the work and person of Jesus, right? So everyone who believes in this message, whether Jew or Greek, has salvation on the table. It's available to them. Everyone who believes has it, but anyone in the world can have it if they choose to believe. For in it, so he's going to continue to talk about why he's not ashamed of the gospel, right? He says it's the power of God. Jews and Greeks both can believe and come into this salvation. And also in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, if you noticed, the word faith is repeated quite a few times, isn't it? That just helps me understand what Paul is slowly introducing, right, as one of the main ideas, or what he wants me to focus in on, at least in this verse, in this little section. Sometimes when you see words start repeating out of nowhere, seemingly, that's an indication that that is a new idea the author's introducing that he really wants you to pay attention to. And it's going to be important that you hang on to that and notice the word faith 
as you progress throughout his writings or the letter or whatever you're reading, okay? And faith here relates to righteousness. Faith here relates to salvation. Faith here is in the gospel. Okay, so I'm just going to do my best as a good Bible student. That's what we're trying to be, is people who are understanding the word of God. I want to do my best uh, to connect any ideas relating to the gospel. So we see that the gospel offers salvation. The gospel is the power, the means by which God accomplishes salvation in a person's life, right? Because the message of, of the gospel is the good news about Jesus and what he's done, right? It's about believing, right? Righteousness. God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel. Not only power, not only salvation, but the righteousness of God is revealed in this gospel so that when someone believes, right, they actually are declared to be righteous. So I just want to be thinking about as I approach this text, what does faith have to do with righteousness? Is there any passages in scripture? Are there any other passages that give me a clear connection between faith and righteousness? Well, the rest of Romans will go on to note that connection pretty clearly, right? So we'll let Paul unpack that progressively throughout the letter. But for now, know this, the righteousness of God is revealed, right? So that when someone believes or has faith in this gospel message, God declares them to be righteous, which is why 2 Corinthians can say that we are the very righteousness of God because the righteousness of God is revealed for us to attain through faith. He extends as a gift his very righteousness to all who believe. So there's something about the gospel that reveals the very righteousness of God, not just in a sense that the gospel shows us God's perfect standard and his perfection so that we realize I fall short of that, but the righteousness of God is made available through the gospel so that you go, that's what I want. And that's how I attain it is through simply believing and trusting. And God's power goes to work to accomplish salvation in a person's life when they believe the gospel. So I want to keep these ideas central as I jump into this next text about the wrath of God. Now think about how faith has repeated. The concept of righteousness has been repeated. The gospel has been repeated. And I just want to take note of that. Any repeating words or ideas, the gospel, faith, or the concept of being righteous or having righteousness. And I want all those ideas in mind thinking about how they connect to what we're about to read. So he'll go on. You'll see that Paul says the word for a lot. It's as if he's progressively building on the ideas um, that he's put forth in the first section of Romans. He's going to continue to explain why he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's going to continue to explain why faith is the means by which God gives righteousness, right? That's the, meth that's the way into salvation. You know, so for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So I want you to think about this. In verse 17, we saw one kind of person. Person number one is righteous. Person number one lives by faith. Not just spiritually they're alive by faith, but they live their lives and walk their lives out according to the faith they have in the gospel. Person number two here is someone who experiences the wrath of God. Person number two here is ungodly and they have unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. I just want to notice that. I want to notice that there is a contrasting here taking place between two kinds of people. One experiences the righteousness of God and salvation. The other experiences, which I'll highlight in blue, anything relating to this second person, right? They experience the wrath of God. They are in ungodliness. They are living in unrighteousness. And you go, that's not what it says. Read on. It'll continue to unpack the kind of person this is. It's a lifestyle marked by ungodliness and unrighteousness, right? Their unrighteousness by that unrighteousness, they actually suppress the truth. In other words, here we're starting to uh, unpack why the wrath of God is released from heaven against these people. Well, they suppress the truth by which they can be saved. They are ungodly and they're unrighteous, meaning they have no righteousness and right standing with God. They're ungodly, meaning they do not have God. 
in their life. They don't have a relationship with God. So I just want to think about how does the wrath of God here relate to what he just said about the righteous living by faith? Well, if you don't have faith, you're not spiritually alive in Christ and you're not righteous and you have no salvation. So the absence of those things is the kind of person he's about to describe, a person who lacks faith, righteousness, salvation, and belief in the gospel, and they lack God. So what's left for these people on their own, in their own darkness, in unbelief and suppression of the truth is nothing but wrath, and it's revealed from heaven. So I want to think about that. Have I seen any, just me as a reader, I I know I've seen the word revealed uh, in a pretty closely connected verse already. And you go, there's no grounds to make this connection. I just want to think about this. This is what we do when we meditate on scripture. I think about how the righteousness of God was revealed in the gospel. And now a contrasting idea, that same word, that concept of revealing and manifesting, uh, making something known is used here but it's in the context of God's wrath being revealed from heaven. So instead of righteousness being shown in the gospel, so people believe, we have the wrath of God being revealed from heaven. So I might want to think about that. How is God's wrath revealed from heaven? And I will probably just continue reading and trust that Paul will clarify. Um, And if he doesn't read the rest of the letter, read the rest of the Bible, it will become pretty clear. So he uses the word for again, which again will act as a sort of because reasoning word for what can be known about God is plain to them. So it's as if Paul is saying, saying, here's why God's wrath is revealed from heaven. Here's why God's wrath comes upon ungodliness and unrighteousness of particularly people who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, in their sin and wickedness. Here's why. Because what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. So just as I said, we see the concept of righteousness being revealed and wrath being revealed. And again, we have God making known or revealing what can be known about him. We have God showing to people, not just any kind of people, but all people. But the kind of person in focus here is the unrighteous, ungodly, you know, person who doesn't believe. They have a revelation about God being very plainly revealed to them. And God has shown that to them, meaning they have a knowledge. They have a degree of data that they can analyze and go, that is evidence of a creator. That is evidence of God, and yet they suppress the truth. So here, Paul explains what the truth is. The truth that he has in mind specifically is what God has made known about himself, what God has shown to all humanity. People suppress that in their unrighteousness, meaning they ignore, deny, excuse their unbelief in uh, of the truth with their unrighteousness becomes like a tool. Uh, Their sin is what they want. John 1 talks about this. People chose their sin, didn't want to come to the light. They preferred their darkness. And Paul will continue to talk about how God has made himself or what can be known about him plain and how he's revealed himself to humanity for His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So here we have this new idea, that being creation, what has been made. Okay, These things clearly reveal the invisible attributes of God. Because you go, God is unseen, God is invisible, God is not seen with the physical eyes. Well, what can be known about God is clearly perceived and seen in what he's made. So his eternal power here, which I'll highlight in blue, and his divine nature, these are the invisible attributes that Paul is referring to. So if I just stopped reading here, what invisible attributes, I would never know. That's why I keep reading. 
when you have questions, have questions, ask them, but keep reading for his invisible attributes, namely that eternal power and divine nature. I mean, how do you visibly uh, represent that? Well, God has chosen to do so. One of the ways is by clearly revealing them in the way he's created the world, in what has been made. So we're supposed to look at the world and creation at large and the complexity and the beauty and the majesty of creation and the intelligence behind creation as evidence of God. And this is the truth people suppress is for some reason they look at creation, they look at the world, they look at what has clearly been made and they suppress, ignore, deny, find a way around that uh, clear data and come to different conclusions because for whatever reason. And Paul says, so they are without excuse. So this is back to why God's wrath falls upon the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth. They are accountable. They are not without excuse. They have, um, or they are without excuse rather, but they're not without information and data and accountability. They should believe, but they don't. Let's go on to continue uh, understanding who this person is and why God's wrath is revealed. For, like I said, in this section, Paul's favorite word is for. He's just building on each idea progressively. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. A lot of new information that I need to process as a Bible reader. Where, where does it say that they knew God? Is this talking about having a relationship and an intimate, familiar knowledge of God or just having a clear, general revelation of God that they could choose to pursue and they chose not to? I would say it's the second. It's the information God has revealed about himself in creation, his eternal power, his divine nature through the world he's made and the intelligence that displays about God, right? They knew God through that. Every human being has a degree of knowledge about God that they are accountable for. No one, is, is, no one has an excuse. We are all without excuse. Well, I didn't know God revealed enough for you to do what you needed to do with it. You suppress the truth. So they knew God. They did not honor him as God. So this is where people get frustrated. They go, God demands worship. No, no God is worthy of worship. God is worthy of honor and thanks. So instead of, I want you to see this word, but here. So they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. This might be the specific way in which Paul means they didn't honor him. One of the examples he gives is they didn't give thanks to God, but here's what they did instead. So instead of honoring and giving thanks, that's one possible option. Instead, they did this, which means these two ideas are at odds with each other. You can't honor God and give thanks and do what they're about to do. These are contrasting ideas. They're opposites. They became futile in their thinking. What does it mean to become futile in their thinking? I might go to a Greek lexicon. I might look up the word futile. I might look at where that word is used and, and look at the context. All those things are helpful, okay? And I definitely encourage you to do so, right? But I usually just say, keep reading. The context will usually give you enough clues about what a word means, um, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I want to pay attention to the passive language that's being used about these people, right? Actively, they did not honor him as God. That's a conscious decision, right? As a result of that, right? Instead of not honoring God and giving thanks, or instead of honoring God and giving thanks, they chose not to, and they become, which seems to be something that is happening to them. They become. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They're not darkening their own hearts necessarily. They're not, uh, you know, I don't know, 
futiling their thinking. It's not a, a verb, but it just became one. They're not, you know, actively futiling their own thinking. What they're doing is making decisions to reject the revelation of God humanity has, the general revelation, suppress that ch- truth, choose unrighteousness and sin, not honor God and give thanks. And by doing so, the consequence or the fruit of that decision is what they become. They descend into more futility, vain. Uh, think of without profit, useless, right? Has no value to it. It's futile. Their thinking is that but they became that by initially choosing not to honor God and give thanks and suppress the truth. And as a result of that, their foolish hearts were darkened. You can go, well, these two things are happening simultaneously. That's fine. Either way, they're related. The thinking here and the hearts are both in mind. So their reasoning faculties, the way they process and see the world becomes futile. And at the same time, or as a result of that, the heart is being darkened. This is not the the lights are growing, you know, being turned off. This is spiritually darkness is overtaking their hearts more and more, more and more. So let's just, you could easily break out a notepad or a word doc and list out the characteristics of this kind of person and see how it progressively works out and happens. Um, that's often what I do with lists. What we have here is a list of characteristics that describe really this foolish person, um, who does a lot of bad (laughs) claiming to be wise. They became fools. So we have, again, what happens to them is they become fools. What did they do to lead to that? They claim to be wise. They boast as if they're, you know, really smart and wise and intellectual and look at my intelligence, bragging about any wisdom, ironically, exposes them as fools and makes them even more foolish because they have no true wisdom if they've rejected the truth and the knowledge of God seen in creation. Um, And what they do is uh, alongside saying, well, look how wise we are. But the irony is that they're fools. Alongside that, they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So here we have the concept of idolatry being introduced. So I want to continue thinking about Paul has given us an idea of the person or a a vague image of the kind of person that believes the gospel. He puts that on pause in verse 17, and he wants to talk about why the wrath of God justly falls on the unbelieving world. And all these are very valid, logical reasons. This is a very reasonable thing for God's wrath to come against these kinds of, these kind of people that live in his world with his breath and his life, him being God, and they don't honor him or give thanks to him. So they become futile. I want to notice the fact that twice they're referred to as being foolish or fools. Just something to consider. The foolishness of rejecting truth and suppressing and ignoring the general revelation of God in creation. So here's why they're fools. Not just all the stuff that's been done above, but mainly here's almost the the pinnacle of their foolishness. The most foolish thing you can do as an image bearer of God living in his world with his breath and life, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, creeping things. In other words, they traded in the immortal, eternally existent creator of the universe and traded him in for images made by human hands that just resemble creation. In other words, they choose to worship the creature and images of creation rather than the creator of all those things that are uh, the substance of that shadow image. Think about an image. I just want to think about that real quick. Why mention the concept of images? Well, if you dig deep enough and you can do a word study on this, we are image bearers of God. We are. We are supposed to be God's reflection in the world. Jesus is the 
perfect image, the express image of the Father. And he's the perfect representation of the Father's character and heart. So he is the image of God. But we're, we're made in the image of God. We're supposed to reflect and represent his character in the earth. So how foolish is it to be an image bearer of God and be his reflection? And instead of pointing people to him and enjoying him, you make your own image. That is merely a shadow copy of what God has actually made. So you're not only worshiping creation, you're worshiping things you have made that are images, shadows of the creation. They're not even the substance. Like it's one level of folly to worship creation. It's another level of folly to worship what you have made, which is only an image of God's creation. It's like a double layer of stupidity. (laughs) So they exchange the glory of the immortal God. And I want to think about, well, this is just questions that I have, okay? If they exchanged the glory of God for man-made images and idols, what does it mean that they had the glory of the immortal God? Did they have that available to them? Did they have that in their possession? Did they actually have a connection to the glory of God? Or were they just on the outskirts, but God was holding out his hands, inviting them into the glory of the immortal God? I think it's that he had it on a silver platter, you know, and the silver platter being the general revelation of God in creation. And he's holding his hands out, which is what he says in Romans 9 and 10. He's holding his hands out, inviting people to come and enjoy his glory. People refuse that, right? And say, nah, we want that. And it's just a bunch of garbage that people have made. This is why The wrath of God is just because people have earned wrath. People have chosen to reject glory, truth, revelation of God, a relationship with him. They choose to reject any sense of uh, logical reasoning about the world that's been created and, you know, portrays intelligence. And they go, ah, got to find a way around that to make an excuse as to why I shouldn't believe in God or a reason why I shouldn't believe in God, and they become fools. This is the progression of someone who continues to suppress the truth and live in sin. You descend into deeper depravity. You could have, you had a degree of knowledge of God. You had the data in front of you, but you made the wrong conclusions. You don't honor God. You don't give thanks. You become futile. It's a progression or a descent into further and further foolishness and depravity and darkness. And by continuing down that road and ignoring every opportunity to come into and enjoy the glory of God and rejecting every opportunity to believe the truth by doing so, you earn for yourself as an unbeliever the wrath, the just wrath of God, which is punishment, penalty for the suppression, rejection, uh, sin, wickedness, unbelief that a person commits. But here we have the fact that all are without excuse. There's no logical reason to reject the clear revelation of God we have in creation and the world at large. So by rejecting this, it does lead a person to earn God's wrath for themselves. They're not, they don't have an excuse. God's wrath justly comes upon them. And we'll see in chapter or verse 24, uh, how this continues. The descent into more wickedness and unbelief and depravity and why we can go, okay, God's wrath, which is to remove the sinner from his creation, um, that is a just consequence. It is a just consequence. God is just and he is at the same time compassionate, loving, merciful, and good. But if someone dies in unbelief, rejecting the immortal God and his glory and truth and the revelation of him in his own world, there are consequences. So hopefully this makes sense why God's wrath is indeed uh, just and um, reasonable.
Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do that and hit the bell so you can be notified of any future videos that come out. And check out AboveReproachMinistry.com. We have completely free Bible study courses, a 40-day program, a 27-day, and 11-day program, all kinds of free resources. You can get a copy of my book. You can join our online church. You can get some merch. We have a bunch of stuff at AboveReproachMinistry.com. And it's also linked in the description below. Go check that out. And thanks for watching.